This hearing will come to order, as was the case at our first hearing this, this committee held in the 116th Congress. We are focusing on the climate crisis. Specifically, we are discussing the latest science and the solutions we urgently need to implement. Thank you, Chairwoman Johnson. As we start this second session of the 116th Congress, I want to thank you for your leadership. And like many of the hearings we held this last year, today's hearing is an opportunity for a constructive dialogue on the issue of climate change. I believe my friends on the other side of the aisle agree with me that the most effective thing we can do on this committee is to address climate change, is to support more basic research that will lead to the next generation of technologies that are needed to reduce global emissions like carbon capture, nuclear power, fusion energy. I'm disappointed that we haven't taken that action, and instead of supporting the technologies of the future, we have focused our attention in the past year on applying research in industries like wind and solar that are already thriving. We won't successfully address greenhouse gas emissions with pie-in-the-sky policies that demand 100% renewable energy at the expense of reliable power from nuclear and fossil fuels. It's unrealistic to limit our future energy mix to only renewable energy. As we've heard from, we will hear from one of our witnesses, Mr. Michael Schellenberg, nuclear power is an incredible resource that is and will continue to be a critical piece of the puzzle in addressing climate change. Nuclear power is safe, clean, reliable, and growing more affordable by the day. Private companies are developing advanced reactors that provide clean, carbon-free power. With support from DOE, these advanced technologies could provide cheap, reliable, emissions-free power around the world. But I ask my colleagues, let's move on from the finger-pointing and focus on tangible innovation and realistic solutions. I thank our witnesses for being here today, and I very much look forward to a productive discussion about these issues. And with that, I yield back, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. Mr. Michael Schellenberger, founder and president of Environmental Progress. Mr. Schellenberger has been an, an environmentalist and social justice advocate for over 25 years. He has worked to preserve California's redwood forests and advocate for clean energy investment. He founded Environmental Progress with the goals of lifting all people out of poverty and saving the natural environment. Mr. Schellenberger graduated from the Peace and Global Studies program at, at Earlham College. Mr. Schellenberger. Good morning, Chairwoman Johnson, Ranking Member Lucas, and members of the committee. I'm very honored to be here. I'm an energy analyst and environmentalist dedicated to the goals of universal prosperity, peace, and environmental protection. Between 20, 2003 and 2009, I advocated for large federal investments in renewables, many of which were made as part of the 2009 stimulus. And since 2013, I've worked with climate scientists for the continued operation of nuclear plants around the world and have helped prevent emissions from increasing the equivalent of adding 23 million cars to the road. I also care about getting the facts and the science right. I believe scientists, journalists, and advocates have an obligation to represent climate science accurately, even if doing so reduces the saliency of our issue. No credible scientific body has claimed climate change threatens the collapse of civilization, much less the extinction of the human species, and yet some activists, scientists, and journalists have made such apocalyptic assertions, which I believe contribute to rising levels of anxiety, including among adolescents, and worsening political polarization. My colleagues and I have carefully reviewed the science, interviewed the scientists and other individuals who have been making these claims, and written a series of articles debunking them. In response, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change has invited me to review its next assessment report, and HarperCollins will publish our research findings as a book this June. While climate change may make some natural disasters more frequent and extreme, the death toll from extreme events could and should continue to decline, as it did over the last century by over 90%, even as the global population quadrupled. Does that mean we shouldn't worry about climate change? Of course not. Policymakers routinely take action on non-apocalyptic problems, and the risk of crossing unknown tipping points rises with higher temperatures. But we should recognize that humans are not passive victims of environmental change. The Netherlands grew very rich while farming up to seven meters below sea level. Poor nations like Bangladesh can and should manage a gradual sea level rise of two feet over the next 80 years. In fact, they're working with the Dutch on that very project right now. 
Future food production will depend far more on whether poor farmers gain access to tractors, irrigation, and fertilizer than temperature rise, according to the best available science assembled by the Food and Agriculture Organization, which calculates crop yields will continue to rise even in high warming scenarios. And there's much we can do to reduce the impacts of climate-driven extremes. For example, the most important factors behind rising severity and frequency of fires in California and Australia are the buildup of wood fuel in forests and the expansion of homes and other buildings in fire-prone areas, both of which can be addressed to protect human lives and those of endangered species. While the world appears to be headed to temperature rise closer to three degrees centigrade over pre-industrial temperatures rather than four, thanks largely to abundant natural gas, nothing is guaranteed. As such, the American people have an interest in supporting reasonable measures to transition from carbon, intense, carbon intensive to low carbon fuels in order to prevent global temperatures from increasing by more than three degrees. The most important of these measures by far is the expanded use of nuclear energy. Thanks in part to decades of public and private investment in fracking, natural gas is today cheap and abundant and thus needs little in terms of new public policy. Solar and wind are popular, but their inherent unreliability, large land use requirements, and large materials requirements mean they make electricity expensive, have large environmental impacts, and are inherently limited in their capacity to replace fossil fuels. Consumers in states with renewable energy standards spent $125 billion more for electricity than they would have other otherwise over the last decade, according to University of Chicago economists in a research report last year. Germany spent 32 billion euros annually on renewables, which is the equivalent of the U.S. spending $200 billion annually between 2014 and 2018, only to increase its share of electricity from solar and wind by 11 percentage points. French electricity, which is 72%, which 72 percent nuclear, produces one-tenth of the carbon emissions as renewables-heavy German electricity at nearly half the price. The U.S. invented nuclear energy for civilian use in the 1950s, and yet over three-quarters of new nuclear reactors globally are being built by the Chinese and Russians. Everyone recognizes that for the U.S. to compete in building nuclear plants abroad, we must build them at home, and yet electric utilities may close half of America's nuclear plants over the next two decades. While the nuclear industry deserves great credit for the continuous improvement of power plant safety and efficiency, Many utility executives today are either resigned to the technology's decline or engaged in wishful thinking. Even were utilities to replace every nuclear plant it closes with small modular reactors, the electricity generated would be roughly two-thirds less. And if nations were to one day opt for smaller reactors, they would likely purchase them from those nations that offer the most favorable financial terms and have the most experience, which is Russia and China. Given all of that, I would like to pose three questions as a public interest advocate of the environment and of nuclear. First, is it in the interest of taxpayers to subsidize U.S. electric utilities to operate existing nuclear plants in the absence of any commitment to build new nuclear plants? Second, does Congress believe the U.S. can compete with China and Russia while shutting down half to two-thirds of its nuclear fleet? Third, is Congress really comfortable standing by and watching dozens of na nations partner with China and Russia to expand their use of nuclear over the next century? If the answer to the latter question is yes, I think Congress should inform the American people that it has decided to cede America's historic role as creator, promoter, and steward of the world's most sensitive dual-use technology to our main geopolitical rivals. In the 1950s, members of Congress understood the sensitive and special nature of this technology and pressured a distracted White House to make American dominance of nuclear energy a top national security priority. I think that uh, the same thing is required today. We need a new act of Congress, perhaps a revision to the Atomic Energy Act, and perhaps we should call it a green nuclear deal in recognition of its importance, not just to national security, but also to the economy, the environment, and the climate. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Schellenberger, just where are we as a nation in advanced nuclear development, and how can we kickstart nuclear energy in the same manner as the shale revolution. Uh, thank you for the, very much for that question. I actually did a, a significant amount of research on the historical origins of the shale revolution. And while there's a number of similarities, there's important differences as well. 
Um, obviously, you know, the, the biggest one with nuclear is just that it is a dual-use technology, and so the main obstacle to nuclear's expansion has always been the fears of its use um, to make weapons. And that's the main reason that I think most progressives and Democrats are, uh, are concerned about it. That was the nature of my opposition to nuclear as a young man. Um, I think where it's similar is that we, the, 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 the shale revolution occurred in the context of significant demand for natural gas. Natural gas has always been viewed as a superior fuel to coal just because of a, a burning much cleaner. Um, it has half the carbon intensity of coal burning. So there was always a significant amount of demand for natural gas. The, we don't have that same demand for nuclear just because it's, it's significantly less popular. I think the other big difference then is that when you look at what's actually succeeded for nuclear, both in the United States historically and uh, with what Russia and China are doing now, is that you have heads of state directly selling nuclear power plants to other heads of state. It's a highly centralized activity. You have a single firm, one or two firms in the United States, it was General Electric and Westinghouse. In China and Russia right now, it's a single state-owned firm. If somebody calls up the Department of Energy in the United States and says, I want to build an AP-1000, which are the reactors that we're building at Vogel in Georgia, there's really not anybody, it would, you would think it would be Bechtel, but Bechtel is only involved in that Vogel project. They're not actively selling nuclear. So I think we've overemphasized the different nuclear technology designs, which just comes from a community that's very technically oriented. But what makes nuclear successful is when it's really embraced and pushed by both the White House and Congress. And you've got, we've got to be building nuclear power plants in the United States or we're simply not going to be competitive abroad. Expand just a little bit more on the concept about the anti-nuclear sentiment, in, which really first, I guess, came around the 1960s and remains today. Can you talk about uh, what's driving that fear and how the relationship to the broader discussion of some of the uh, predictions about climate change, how all this interacts? Nuclear is special. So we sometimes say we need all these different solutions for climate change, carbon capture and storage, solar, wind, and nuclear. But nuclear is unlike the rest of those. This is a radical technological, revolutionary technological development, both in the dual nature of the technology, the incredible energy density of it, and I think that really we suffered, I think the whole human race suffered a kind of trauma and shock when, the, when we invented the bomb in the 1940s. And then there was a lot of enthusiasm after Adams for Peace in 1953 that we would sort of redeem ourselves for having invented such a horrible weapon with nuclear energy. So there's a lot of enthusiasm in the 50s. But ultimately what happened is that the fears of nuclear weapons transferred themselves, just to use a bit of psychological jargon, onto power plants. And anti-nuclear weapons activists somehow imagined that shutting down nuclear power plants would rid the world of nuclear weapons. That's really never gone away. In fact, the apocalyptic concerns that we see around climate change today began with apocalyptic concerns around nuclear weapons. And as the Cold War ended, really those, the, the people that were looking for some kind of secular apocalypse found it with climate change, which is why I think so much of the climate activists and environmentalist community is opposed to nuclear. So I think the only way to overcome, I think, the, I think the main, when you kind of get, I think, to the, the chairwoman's question, what is the main obstacle to significant accelerated decarbonization? It's getting over our fear of this technology. Uh, nuclear energy is our true blessing. It emits almost zero air and water pollution. In my view, it's the only true replacement of fossil fuels. Renewables are just too energy dilute and intermittent to be able to do that. So we need some kind of a, a shift in consciousness, and I think Congress, uh, congressional leadership and White House leadership is really important to that. Thank you, sir. And so my question to each of you, uh, 30, 45 seconds apiece, is what do you propose to stop India and China from emitting so much carbon? Uh, we should absolutely not force poor countries to stay poor, which is basically what that would require. I mean, moving from wood and dung to burning fossil fuels is environmental and human progress. It would be unethical to punish poor countries and force them to stick with wood and coal. The reductions in emissions in the rich world are, simple, are not done because we sacrificed, it's because we moved to natural gas. China and India will follow that same pathway by moving to natural gas, but it would be crazy and immoral right. to, prevent, to force poor countries to stay poor. Mr. Schellenberger, there are some radical <clears throat> mandates and reforms that are disguised as solutions to the ch changing climate. Green New Deal comes to mind. Does that sound familiar? <laughs> I've written about it extensively. You, you've written about it extensively. Yeah. 
let's use Germany as a model. They made the decision, as you're probably well aware, to phase out both nuclear and coal plants. They spent 32 billion, with a B, euros per year on renewable energy between 2014 and 2018. What do they have to show for it? A mere 40% of the electricity supply is now renewables and hardly any zero decrease in emissions, hardly. Nuclear, who knew, just might be part of the answer. Would you agree, yes or no? Absolutely. That's even better than yes. <laughs> so my question to you is this. What are the major hurdles preventing nuclear from being the cost-competitive solution in the United States? And please don't say Democrats. We're in an open hearing here. <laughs> well, I, there's, in short, the short version is it's, there's, a, there's a number of factors, but one of the main problems in the United States has been that we have many utilities, and what that means is that we've had many different operators and many different plant designs. So the economics of nuclear are really simple. The way that costs come down is by standardizing the same design, having the same people build it over and over again. That's the only way we know how to reduce costs, also by increasing the size of the reactor. That's what's worked to reduce costs in France and South Korea, even in some parts of the United States. So that's a major obstacle. Um, and like I mentioned, it's also been the fear of nuclear. So the way that the, the anti-nuclear folks drove up costs was through lawsuits and, and regulatory ratcheting, which delayed construction and, and drove up the costs. So I, th this is why I want to warn against, I think there's a lot of wishful thinking that we're going to get some new design that's going to solve these problems. But re what really matters is a long-term commitment to building the same kind of reactor over and over again, preferably with the same construction managers. Are you aware that with the argument that the problem is storage of the waste, that's the major problem here? It's what we do in America. Of course, you've been, I'm sure you're watching the ongoing debacle about Yucca Mountain. I'm sure you've been paying attention to that. I did a little research, and we, there, there's many types, as you know, radioactive waste. The United States only has one facility engaged in permanent disposal of nuclear waste, the Waste Isolation Pilot Plant in New Mexico, which permanently stores certain forms of radioactive waste genera generated by the DOE during research and production of nuclear weapons. Are you aware of that? Yes. So we've got to do get better that. We've got to come to a consensus on how we're going to handle this waste. And then we have the ultimate green energy. Would you agree? I agree, and the only, the only caveat I would add is that I think that the fear of so-called nuclear waste, which is just the used fuel rods, is again just a displaced anxiety around nuclear weapons. As an environmentalist, nuclear waste is the major environmental benefit of nuclear power plants. It's the, it's, when you go to take an environmental studies class, the first thing you learn is that the perfect environmental production methods store all of the waste at the site of production. Only nuclear does that. Solar produce, solar panels create 300 times more waste than nuclear. It's all going to go say, to landfills. Say that again. Solar panels produce 300 times more waste than nuclear. It's all going to go to landfills. Only nuclear, only nuclear contains all of its own waste product. Those, the nuclear waste has never hurt anybody, never should hurt anybody. It can all fit on a single football field stacked 50 feet high. As an environmentalist, this is the holy grail of energy production. Thank you for that. Madam Chair, I yield back. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, my first question for Mr. Schellenberger. Certainly, I believe in an all-the-above approach when it comes to domestic energy production. How would you respond to those who believe that advances in renewable energy technologies have eliminated or will eliminate the need for energy and other traditional sources? I think, and, and thank you for asking that question, and I also would, I'll address some of this to Mr. Pullmerter too, I think around the story. I think we have to understand that energy density of fuel determines the environmental impact, full stop. This is a physical process. So the, the energy density of wood is half that of coal. The energy density of a, of a, of a quantity of uranium is a million times higher than coal. So, so to the question of uranium mining, well, first of all, most of it's now in situ underground. It doesn't actually, we don't actually dig anything up. But you're having a, this, this amount of uranium, or really two glasses worth of uranium, is enough uranium to power my entire life. So, so the question is, I mean, do we really need, you know, I mean, this is the issue with renewables. Do you really need renewables if you have nuclear? Well, France did an experiment. It had 75% nuclear. 
it added a bunch of wind. In order to add all of that wind onto the grid, it had to increase the amount of natural gas it burned. Its carbon intensity went up. So I just think you have, I think we have to just ground ourselves in the fact that energy density of fuel determines environmental impact. Humans gradually move from energy dilute fuels towards energy dense ones. So I go back to my questions. Yeah. Do you believe the advances in renewable energy technologies have eliminated or will eliminate the need for energy from other traditional sources? No, and they can't because we can't make sunlight or wind more energy dense and we can't make them more reliable, which okay. is why a solar farm takes 380 times more land than a nuclear plant. <clears throat> it's not going to change. Okay. Uh, next question also for Mr. Schellenberger. What do you think things like the New Green Deal will do to energy prices for consumers? Yeah, I mean, anything, what we know is that a significant deployment of solar and wind increase electricity prices. It increased electricity prices in Germany by 50 percent. They now pay about 50 percent more than their neighbors. We saw that in California, our electricity prices went up seven times more than the rest of the United States because of our integration of renewables. There's no mystery as to why. To integrate significantly unreliable electricity onto the grid, you have to have 100 percent backup, usually from natural gas or some other source of energy. And of course, as you point out, ener raising energy prices, like increasing the price of food, is regressive. The people that suffer the most are the poor and the working class. So anything that increases energy prices is going to be regressive and harmful to, to working class and poor people. OK, I'll stay with you, I guess, for my last uh, question, If you would see if you would kind of agree with this uh, philosophy. To me, the greatest uh, determinant of the carbon footprint of this world over the next decade or two will be the world economy. That if we have a strong world economy, we can do things like uh, provide infrastructure for natural gas. To you know, to your point, in a bad economy, people burn wood, very energy light, uh, versus being able to burn natural gas, which is going to be more more efficient and more energy dense. Uh, do you have any comments on that concept? Well, you're you're right in the in the sense that we we move we decarbonize along with economic growth. The idea that we need to have less economic growth in order to decarbonize is not grounded in reality. It's not grounded in historical fact. It's also there's no obviously it's terrible for political economy, and that's the reason why climate change legislation, cap and trade legislation failed is because people didn't want to increase energy prices. What we saw is that the U American consumers benefited to the to $100 billion a year thanks to cheaper natural gas prices. So our emissions from electricity have been going down thanks to cheap and abundant natural gas as our electricity prices have been going down from cheap natural gas. The French are not poor. They're the most decarbonized economy in that part, or next to Sweden, the most decarbonized economy. They're not poor because they've slashed their emissions and decarbonized their energy sector. Wealth and decarbonization go hand in hand. Well, now, but Mr. Selinger, in your testimony, uh, you say that that if nothing changes, China will surpass the U.S. in, in um, installed nuclear capacity by 2030 and Russia by 2034. So here's my question. Could you elaborate on, in your testimony, uh, you say that that if nothing changes, China will surpass the U.S. in, its, in um, installed nuclear capacity by 2030 and Russia by 2034. So here's my question. Could you elaborate on the investments in technologies like that we're developing there at Purdue and help give us an advantage in this global competition, as well as uh, if the U.S. develops advanced reactors or small modular reactors, uh, how much of an international advantage would that give us and is that the type of technology that is best exported, uh, suited to be exported? Thank you, sir, for that question. Uh, what I want to stress about nuclear, advanced nuclear technologies and nuclear technologies is that they are at risk of becoming orphans without a national nuclear program, without something like a green nuclear deal. And so China and Russia are also developing small modular reactors. They're also, they're also developing non-water-cooled reactors, ones that use molten salt or, uh, li uh, or liquid sodium reactors like we've developed. So when countries make decisions about who to partner with, they're actually choosing countries based on which countries have the most experience building those reactors. As, you, as a policymaker, I'm sure you can understand, if you're looking to make a big investment with taxpayer funding, you want to go with the tried and true um, uh, management as well as design. And so my concern is that these promising new reactor technologies we're developing, that we're not really going to have, we're not really set up at all 
to be competing with the Chinese and Russians. We need our head of state selling them to compete with Putin and Xi who are aggressively selling them. We need to have the right financing for countries. And when countries, when they say to us now, who would build this plant for us? We don't have an answer. The answer needs to either be Bechtel or, or some other major construction firm. And right now, we sort of say to them, hey, you can pick whoever you want. When you go to Russia or China, they say, here's exactly here's how it'll work. Here's the people that will build it. Here's the financing for you to build it. And like I mentioned, you know, this is a very special technology. It's a dual-use technology. The U.S. government has always understood that nuclear, that the United States needed to be leaders on nuclear. And right now, I worry that we've engaged in a kind of wishful thinking that somehow some new technological breakthrough will make the difference when, in fact, our technological breakthroughs just aren't that different from the technological breakthroughs that we're seeing in Russia and China. Thank you. Uh, I would like to add, have you add on to that. Um, you know, of the technologies that we have right now, and if we could fully develop some more of those, what's the potential for nuclear energy to supply? What percentage of our energy needs around the world? I mean, I, I believe that eventually we will be 100% nuclear. It may not be for another 200 years, but it's such a clearly superior energy technology. I think that is eventually what will be. Obviously, you know, France has proven that it can be 75, 80% nuclear without any problems. We are, the United States was headed towards 50% nuclear. The anti-nuclear movement succeeded in killing half of all reactors, a little bit over half, so today we get 20%. I think it would be a perfect goal to have to get the United States back up to 50% nuclear. The market right now, China has a, uh, Russia and China have order books of about $150 billion for new nuclear builds. This is great business. This is big construction projects, high technology, well-paying jobs. It's just, I find myself um, uh, very concerned by, by the ways in which we're sort of sleepwalking into third place in this global competition. Final question to uh, Mr. Schellenberger. Can you just give a quick 30-second uh, illustration of fission versus fusion, and wouldn't it be great if we could get to fusion, and when are we going to get there? <laughs> I, I don't, I mean, honestly, I'm, I'm, I have an unorthodox view on this, which is that I think fusion is probably inevitable. I don't think it's anytime soon. It could be hundreds of years away. And I don't think that the advantages are all that greater over fission. I mean, fission already, we radically dematerialize, decarbonize with fission. The, uh, you know, like I said, I don't think it's a technological problem. I think it's more of a, of a consciousness problem, a fear problem, an institutional problem. Um, I still support uh, R&D for fusion, I just don't think it's it's the holy grail that a lot of other people think it to be. Uh, it looks to me like, from what I hear, and I've read a lot of your stuff here, uh, Mr. Schellenberger, and, um, that nuclear may be the, the only way uh, that we can uh, get off of uh, the dependence on uh, fossil fuels or or uh, because obviously we uh, the renewables don't seem to cut the mustard. Uh, but the U.S. has always been the leader in nuclear power construction in the past uh, for safe and reliable nuclear plants. Uh, but uh, I noticed that China and Russia are leading in the number of plant construction uh, around the world. Many, uh, many other nations are uh, kind of uh, saddling up to them in dependence uh, on, on those, these two nations when we build a better plant. Uh, at what point do you see clean energy becoming cheaper and more viable? And is it going to be uh, a reversal of the, the trend that we're seeing on nuclear here in the, in the United States? And when you say clean energy, are you referring sort of nuclear in specific, or are you saying um, all low-carbon energies, including renewables? I, I would say, well, I was talking specifically about the nuclear uh, end of it, because you had, had so much uh, in your uh, documentation here that I was reading about, so I would say that. Yeah, I you mean, can throw key, in the other ones, too. I'd like to, I'd like to hear what you have. Sure. I'll give you one uh, study we did where we calculated that had Germany spent the $580 billion it's estimated to spend on renewables by 2025, had it spent it on nuclear, it would already be at 100 yeah. percent zero emissions right electricity, and it would have completely decarbonized its transportation supply. Uh, similar case in California. So it's very easy to do those calculations. The, the, the challenge for nuclear is that it requires national level commitment from the top. It really requires the president to be a leader on it. It requires significant congressional leadership. I would note that, for example, Russia 
is also has abundant natural gas supplies. And what it's choosing to do is replace its use of natural gas domestically with nuclear power plants and export its natural gas abroad. That seems like a great recipe for energy dominance. It seems like that would be the heart of an energy dominance strategy internationally and one that the United States would do well to follow. But again, it really requires this kind of long-term national commitment. Absolutely. Right. Uh, we also uh, hear some of this extreme rhetoric uh, civilization will end without radical action. Children are suffering from eco-anxiety and depression. And uh, no credible science, I noticed, or, or, I read where no credible scientific body has ever claimed that climate change threatens the collapse of our civilization or the extinction of homo sapiens. And uh, yet we hear politicians in the media are making these claims. I'd like to hear your opinion and uh, tell me what you're thinking about that. Thank you for asking that question. It's very troubling, the rise of this rhetoric. It's obviously been around for several decades, but it's become much more acute in recent years. What we've done is we've went and interviewed the scientists who activists told us they were relying on for those catastrophist claims. Four of the scientists we interviewed all claimed that they were misquoted. One of them told us that it was based on his best estimation that the world could not sustain half of its human population at four degree temperature rise. We asked him what that was based on. He said it was just him speculating. In fact, there are studies by the Food and Agriculture Organization and the major factors that determine how much food we will grow, because the only way you can really come up with collapse of civilization scenarios is with a collapse of food supply, that the major studies show that, the, that the, what determines food output in the future is the same thing that's determined in the past, which is whether poor countries have access to fertilizer, irrigation, and tractors. And so if we're really concerned about um, sub-Saharan Africa, for example, or South Asia, where people are much more vulnerable and dependent on, on nature, on uh, less resilient, then we should be helping them to, to industrialize agriculture, to, in, you know, to, to urbanize, to gain access to factories. That's already starting to happen in Ethiopia. It should happen in the rest of the continent. So what bothers me is the way that this apocalyptic discourse is used to justify denying poor countries cheap baseload electricity, not just from fossil fuels, but we've also seen this effort to stop poor countries from getting large hydroelectric dams and large nuclear power plants. So what I always say to my colleagues is if you're so worried about denial, then I think you should stop trying to deny poor countries the cheap reliable sources of electricity and energy that they need in order to survive a hotter world. Mr. Schellenberger, you're getting a lot of attention, and uh, I have to say I'm very happy about that. Um, the district that I represent in western Pennsylvania is the home of the original shipping port nuclear power plant, um, the first civilian reactor built in the United States as part of the same program that led us to, to build uh, reactors for our ocean-going vessels in the Navy. Um, and in my office, I have a picture of uh, President Eisenhower waving this was actually a fake wand. Um, he he did a little press event to show the start of the construction of that, but he was somewhere else at the time, and he waved a wand, and the first uh, backhoe or whatever started moving dirt at shipping ports. So we have a, a plant there now, Beaver Valley, uh, which is at risk of being closed. Um, you know, nuclear, in a lot of ways, the lack of support for it in our, at our federal government shows a lot of the things that are wrong with Washington. Um, in that it, it has no natural friend on, on the side of those who consider themselves the environmental left. Uh, but frankly, it also has been kind of unfairly targeted and undermined by certain fossil fuel lobbies. And in our own state, um, natural gas has become so cheap that it makes it difficult for nuclear to compete without any sort of uh, support. Um, and people make it seem like the request for support is an act, you know, a request for, a, you know, kind of an unfair thumb on the scale, which couldn't be any further from the truth. I mean, nuclear just does something that natural gas does not do, which is produce energy without carbon, and it does not get compensated for it at all. And so, um, you know, we're left with the support for nuclear being among scientists, you know, people who are neither on really the right or left, but simply the side of the facts. And so I thank you for presenting those so well today. Um, in addition to the scientific facts, I just want to point out some social facts about nuclear power, uh, which is that it employs thousands, actually tens of thousands, of veterans and union electricians and union construction workers in my state already. So we're not talking about the future potential of renewable energy, for example, to create as many jobs as it may erase. We're talking about people who are already working 
and earning good middle class salaries and raising their families based on this technology which was invented by our government for an idealistic and environmental purpose. And I know you know that, but I just want to make sure that the jobs angle is included. And to uh, my friend, Mr. Brooks, who was asking about, well, what do we do about India, China, Russia? At least with respect to India, one of the things we do is sell them nuclear energy. And you've started to point that out today, but I think on a grander scale, I've been told it's we're looking at about a trillion dollar export market, probably maybe more, um, that will go to someone. So this is a trillion dollars worth not only of the construction workers who go to build the plant and the designers, but the people in my state who make all the parts. There's a manufacturer in my state who does about half its business for civilian nuclear reactors and half for the Navy. And when I visited, they told me this hilarious example where uh, when the Chinese come to buy replacement parts for their AP-1000s that they have, they literally have to put sheets and blankets over the Navy equipment that they're making in the same warehouse so they don't steal our naval technology. So this really exists that we have a manufacturing economy related to this. Um, and if we want to preserve those jobs and increase them by selling this stuff domestically and overseas, You've talked about the president being a salesman. Um, I think that works for the overseas market, but for the domestic market, any ideas in the minute and a half I have remaining on what we would actually do to make it economically feasible again? Is it purely deregulatory? And if so, you know, what are the couple of the, the most important things we can do? Go ahead. Uh, I, I mean, I think the most important thing is a, is a national green nuclear deal so that this is not just advocated by people that happen to have a lot of nuclear in their states or districts. Exelon, which is one of the biggest operators of nuclear plants in the United States, is seeking some sort of subsidy. My view is there should that any subsidy for nuclear should be in the context of a nuclear growth strategy. Right now, the official strategy of the U.S. nuclear industry is of managed decline. I think that's unacceptable. We're, I don't think we, it's in the taxpayer interest to subsidize an industry that is committed to decline. We need to have a, we need to have a growth strategy. You're absolutely right. I mean, there, for me, my view is that the world will go to nuclear after we exhaust every other option, after we try everything else and we discover it doesn't work, when clearly we have this amazing technical fix in our hands, and it's one that we must take responsibility over because of the dual, dual use of the technology. So the go maybe to cut it short, the government would have to show commitment beyond just changing a few rules, but purchase agreements, for example, and things that show that w the money will really be there for a long term and the market will exist. Yeah, I mean, Senator Lamar Alexander for decades had advocated a significant scaling up of nuclear plants. It was basically the right plan. There's really not some... I think everything else is basically wishful thinking if, unless you're in the place of actually of having a really concrete proposals to build nuclear plants. Thank you. Um, now, as I understand it, nuclear reactors are currently only custom built, which generates significant costs. How important is the R&D component uh, from an investment standpoint to promote advanced nuclear reactors? I, I think it's a small but exaggerated part. Okay. I'm, I mean, my views are, are I have a minority of view of this and within the pro-nuclear community. I think there's a fetishization of new designs and of that particular phase of the process. Certainly, I mean, basically, if you look even at solar panels, which have experienced a significant decline in cost, 90% decline in cost, it wasn't a breakthrough with a different design. It was actually the same boring old silicon solar panel that they just mass manufactured in big factories in China. Right. And so, so your point about scale is really, really important. What brings down the price is being able to do the same. It's just factory type production or mass manufacturing that brings down prices. And how does the U.S. currently sit from a competitive standpoint relative to uh, other nations in developing the technology? I mean, we're basically, I mean, as far as I can tell, we don't have a significant advantage in terms of new smaller reactors or, or novel designs that use a different coolant than, than water. Uh, the Russians and the Chinese are all pursuing that. The Koreans are certainly pursuing it. We see the Canadians are getting into it. I, again, I just think there's just way too much emphasis on design type because I think there's some idea that we're going to have some kind of a breakthrough in design, yeah. but that's just not consistent with any physical understanding of the technology or the history. Okay. So what would be the most helpful in terms of uh, increasing our competitiveness? We need to be building significant amounts of nuclear power plants at home. There's really no, al there's no alternative to it. So if you're 
uh, uh, Nigeria and you're considering who to go with and the Chinese and the Russians and the Americans come and the Chinese and the Russians are like, yeah, we're building you know, 10 reactors in the next 10 years and the Chinese are like, we're building 20 and the United States is like, well, we're, we were building four but then we canceled two of them and we're hoping to get the two done and maybe we'll build some other kinds but we're not really sure. And by the way, we don't really know who you could work with in the United States, but good luck. I mean, that's just not a competitive offering. Right. Um, no, I certainly share that opinion. Uh, Technological advancements that threaten the environment too, like p plastic and the m large amounts of plastic that's floating out there in the Pacific Ocean and that interfere with birds and fish and eating and killing and dying and blah, blah, blah in Midway Ireland. Anybody got any experience on plastic and what we, yes sir, please. Could I add one thing to your question? Sure, please. The, the, the one thing we do know is that what determines whether or not significant amounts of plastic waste make it to the ocean is whether or not a, a nation has a waste collection and management system. So we know that most of that plastic waste in the ocean is coming from countries that don't have waste collection and management systems and the countries that don't have waste collection and management systems are poor countries. So it's another kind of case of why we need economic development. But even we have waste collection systems, if we don't get rid of single-use plastics, and I commend my chair for having these glasses and, and, and water that we can pour rather than continue to use these single-use plastics, which so many of the committees do, which is just, just uh, d d awful to watch and witness. That Beyond that, I want to talk to you anyway. Yeah, okay. You talked about <laughs> Senator Alexander, and he's my friend, and he might be for witnesses and be for common sense and the Constitution and fairness and justice and all those things. But he's not necessarily in favor of, of Belafonte being redone. And you know Belafonte in Alabama, do you not? I do. And there, there's a private group called Nuclear Development that wants to develop Belafonte, and they want to do it privately and think they can do it. Uh, would that not be something we need to pursue and that's uh, maybe where Lamar has a little error in his uh, otherwise stellar <laughs> record on nuclear? P possibly, although my, my big point on nuclear is that we need a national nuclear strategy, and so we've got to get away from this hodgepodge potpourri nuclear and to have something approaching what we were doing in the 50s or something that's much more similar to what the Russians and Chinese are doing. Otherwise, it's just a kind of every day some new nuclear project that we kind of project our hopes onto, but it's not, you know, it's not actually a plan. But do we... Like, do you, do you know anything about the Belafonte plan? Do you, do you know how practical that is? I mean, they've got some experts from Canada working on it. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm the most pro-nuclear person I know. So, I mean, I'm in favor of doing more nuclear, but I'm here to say that I, I, I've, we've had decades of people being like, why don't we try this, why don't we try that? And that's not a plan. The Chinese and Russians have a plan. And if we're, if we're ready to cede this dual-use technology to the Russians and Chinese, we should make that decision because right now we're just, well, that, that's, into that's, it. Uh, that'll be close out of that. I'm happy to hear the Russians have a plan because if the Russians have a plan, then Trump will have a plan. <laughs> <laughs> I yield back the balance of my time.